Yes, here we go. I also need to say a special thanks to a few other people. Uh, Bob's already there in the middle. On the left, I think Daniel, you met last fall. Uh, he gave a talk about Birds of Columbia. He's an amazing guide in Columbia. I've had the privilege to go on far too many thousands of kilometers crisscrossing Columbia with in, in chase of yet one more hummingbird. And Boris Herrera, who's based in Ecuador, has taken Bob and I through Ecuador and Peru on numerous trips, um, again, chasing a lot of great, amazing species. And what's incredible about both of these guides is that you tell them a bird and they will find it. They know the flower, they know the calls, and uh, they're really, really, really dedicated guides that it's been a privilege to work with. Um, the map on the right shows some of the trips that have crisscrossed over the last 15 years across the Northern Andes, probably about 15 trips, I think, in total, um, trying to photograph what became one more, one more, one more hummingbird until it became a project to see how many of the species that are there could I actually photograph? And one of the first questions, I'm oh, sorry, so the objectives tonight, um, just a quick summary, talk a bit, a bit about the taxonomy of hummingbirds, a little bit about how the geograph geography, the Andean uplift has impacted the evolution of hummingbirds, the genetics, morphology, a little bit about iridescence, physiologic adaptations, uh, the threat of extinction for a lot of these amazing hummingbirds, then also focus a bit on photography. Um, Steve asked me to talk a bit about that since it's a photography group. And then if I've convinced anyone to perhaps go and chase some of these amazing birds, uh, the logistics, how you get there, a couple tips, what to watch out for, where to go and what not to do. Um, so the first question is how many hummingbird species are there actually in Northern Andes? Bob and I have debated this many times. And it's a moving goalpost that keeps changing. Almost every time if I were to give this talk, that number on the bottom has to change. And one would think it's because they found new species. And sometimes they do, like in May 2007, they found the gorgeous Puffleck in <clears throat> Southwest Colombia. Uh, a couple of years ago, they found another hill star uh, in Ecuador. But the main reason really has more to do with taxonomy and uh, the splitting of subspecies into species. And some basic definitions, the species most people consider a group of living organisms consisting of similar individuals capable of exchanging genes or interbreeding. Biologically, this is based on species being reproductively isolated from each other. Under this definition, distinct geographic forms of the same kind are usually lumped as one species. And here is shown as the white-necked jacobin, which has one of the widest distributions in the Northern Andes and across the Amazon basin. A subspecies is generally referred to a population or subdivision of the species where there's some morphologic characteristic that's different. So shown here um, are the booted racket tail. On the left is the species on the Western Andes, which has white little boots. And on the right is the subspecies in the Eastern Andes, which has buff colored boots, but they're both still booted racket tails. So when does a species, so sorry, when does a subspecies become a distinct species? And it's when this committee, the SACC, says that now you're uh, defined as a species. The phylogenetic concept states that diagnosable geographic forms of the same basic kind of bird should be, distinct, be treated as the same subspecies because they've evolved separately geographically through unique, through unique evolutionary histories. Shown here um, on the left is the Santa Marta blossom, blossom plant, which resides way up here in the very north. And in central Colombia is the Talima blossom crown. They're geographically distinct. There's slight differences in size and coloration of the tail. And it took until 19, no, November 2014, where with some geographic sort of some uh, genetic data, these were split into two separate species. Sometimes, though, the committee will do the decision just based on um, size, morphologic features. As shown here, last year they white-tailed his tail. Hill star was split into two species, the one in the Western Andes now called the Rufus Gaped Hill star, and the one from the Eastern Andes called the Greenbacked Hill star. So that, if anything, is what's driving the number of hummingbirds that keep going up, 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 up as to what are the number of species in the <clears throat> Northern Andes. Two phenomena that are important, the concept of adaptive radiation, where there's a rapid adaptation to new environment and differentiation to new distinct species. And the Andean uplift that I'm going to talk about in a minute, 
as the Andes formed, there was all kinds of new little eco, uh, biologic niches for both plants and hummingbirds to evolve in. If you look at the Andes, they start here in Chile, Bolivia, come up as a chain, and by the time they get to Peru, um, into Ecuador, they've split into an eastern and a western uh, branch. And by the time they get into Colombia, you get your eastern, the central Andes, the western Andes. The eastern Andes continue on up into Venezuela, and up in here is a separate little mountain really related more to volcanic origin, Santa Marta. But more importantly is if you look at the geologic history of the Andes, you can see that each of these lines shows the profile of what the Andes looked like 35 million, 25 million, 10 million years ago, and now at present. And there were major uplifts of the Andes um, here, more so on the west. And I can't see that there's people here, but I think over here, uh, you can see the Eastern Andes in the last 5 million years. And then recently, there's been genetic data where they've been able to trace back the origins of a lot of the species. A lot of this work has been done, and this slide comes from Jim McGuire, who's actually at UC Berkeley, he published in 2014. Traditionally, there have been two families of hummingbirds, the hermits and the trochlinii, but he, based on genetic data, determined there's actually nine clads of hummingbirds. And although they split initially from the swifts 42 million years ago, most of the first vacation in South America began in the last 15 million years. And shown in this slide here in the lower right, the Andes accounts for about 40% the black line of the hummingbird diversity, even though it's only about 7% of the land mass. But if you take this slide here and look at the detail of the hermits shown here, what's interesting is the split of the hermits, if you go back far enough, about 12, 13 million years, the first split that occurred here was really with the sickle bills, the white-tipped sickle bill, the buff-tailed sickle bill, or some of their earliest ancestors of um, the hummingbirds. And there was another split here then that was to the saw-billed hummingbird here, the rapanon, and this entire then large group of other hummingbirds, the hermits. And the saw-billed hermit shown here is by many considered sort of one of the uh, earlier forms of a hummingbird has a straight build of the hermits with a hook bill, now is only found in Southeast Brazil. And by contrast, the great chinned um, hermit shown here, one of the newer ones in the last couple million years, is much smaller with a sharply demarcated curved bill. So they've traced all this back and it's sort of fascinating as you travel through the area and you're looking at the evolution of these birds to try to appreciate what's actually happened. Um, the hummingbirds have one of the highest rates of DNA turnover among all avian species. Only one family, the flycatchers, has more species than the 350 total species of hummingbirds. And if you look at some of the ways they've evolved, uh, you know, look at each of these individually, perhaps one of the most interesting ones is bill shape. Uh, here are two forms of the hermit, the barbed throat, which is a relative straight, and then a green hermit with a curved bill. The tooth-billed hummingbird here is one of the early precursors. Again, it's from the mango clad, and again, it has a hook on the tip uh, and actually teeth serrations in its bill here. The wedge-billed hummingbird here is almost like a wedge, like a drill. The sword-billed hummingbird, I'm sure Elnor will remember um, with its uh, enormous long bill. And mountain avocet bill has an upturned bill. Then there's some that have very small fine bills and much longer, almost like lance-like bills. But what's incredible is that each of these birds has found a certain flower in the niche of all the hundreds of thousands of flowers of the Andes that that bill is specific to. The smaller hermits uh, here with the ginger type plants fits perfectly. A white whiskered hermit here, uh, the shrimp plant, the longer curved blossom. The puff legs are at the higher elevations with the much smaller ericacea. The sickle bill is a perfect match for the central pogon curvature of the flower, the sword-billed hummingbird for the trumpet vine, and a couple of other the large, large blossoms. And the wedge build shown over here actually drills into the base of uh, the flowers like that doodle on here. But what's even more interesting is there's actually even differences in the build curvature by sex. There can be sexual dimorphism in some species like hermits, velvet breasts, and saber wings. The females have longer, less curved bills, shown here, these three. And the male generally has a shorter bill with a greater curvature. 
And this similar, this, this similar bill shape encourages preferential differences by sex and flower selection, i.e. territorial economics and partitioning of floral food resources for the bird. If you look at body morphology, um, what's evolved there, I could spend an hour on this through the very thing. Some uh, have amazing haircuts, which we probably all need. <laughs> A favorite of a lot of birders, the Rufus Crested Coquette has the spiky hair. And usually when they, this is an immature male, when it becomes mature, there'll be little green discs on the ends of all of these. Uh, the spike cut of the helmet crests. The violet ears shown here, their ears flare out uh, when they're aggressive territorially or just uh, displaying. And the three species, although there's overlap across the range between the lesser violet ear, brown violet ear and sparkling violet ear, Differences in tail, some will grow rackets like the racket tail, the Buddha racket tail, the marvelous spatula tail has these huge spatules. Some grow long, long, long tails like the green tail train bearer shown here. And even longer, the black tail train bearer, this tail here is almost twice the length of the hummingbird. Others will have incredible iridescence in their tail like the violet tailed sylph here and the long-tailed sylph. This one's usually on the Western Andes, this one more so in the Eastern Andes. And if you talk a bit about iridescence of hummingbirds, uh, if you go back a little bit to the physics to understand, I think hopefully most people know this, but just quickly, when you see a red cardinal, what you're actually seeing is the color that's been reflected off of the bird. All the other colors have been absorbed in the bird. Refraction's a little different in that the waves come in and then as there's boundaries, the light will get bent and reflected back in certain uh, colors. That can happen in what's called constructive interference where when it comes back, the waves can add up and be a stronger wave or it can be destructive shown here where they cancel out. And for the hummingbird, this happens in its feathers. There's three layers of films um, that are sort of keratin with air where the size of these little particles determines which colors get refracted back. And it's like a natural amplifier. And if you look here at these pictures of ruby topaz, you can see this was actually almost in an overcast, dark forest. There was very little light when this was happening. And the bird was just sitting there. And depending upon the position in relation to the incident light, you could see here there was almost nothing. Here it starts to go a little bit the ruby color and ultimately the topaz color shown here. And in the next video, there's no audio to it to try to keep the bandwidth, I guess, on the transmissions down. But if you pay attention, this is an Empress Brilliant uh, in a, a resort, of a, sorry, town in Chero Montezuma, Colombia. And if you pay attention to what the bird is doing to its forehead and the belly here. And it was just sitting there and there's other birds flying by, it was sort of ter defending its territory. It's quite amazing to watch what it does. It's actually a dynamic process where it's moving its feathers and its head. And I'm sure there's colors and other, whether infrared or whatever that the other birds are seeing that we can't see how it's actively changing the color it's displaying by moving its feathers. So some of the functions of iridescence in hummingbirds, it can maximize the conspicuous or the visual signal to an intended receiver, whether it be a mate or a rival, or it can remain relatively inconspicuous predator avoidance. It encodes information about the sex, age, and general health of the birds. Um, it helps with sexual recognition. It's also involved with aggressive display behavior with feeding territoriality. And most remarkable is the diversity in iridescence, which has evolved in hummingbirds. Perhaps the most brilliant ones are the family called the emeralds. Uh, they're literally every flower, sorry, every feather is just irid iridescent uh, blue, green. The Western emerald found in the Western Andes of Colombian to Ecuador is a blue green. As you go to Northern Colombia and to the Caribbean coast, it's replaced by the red-billed Amazon, sorry, the red-billed emerald shown here. And it's named for that little bit of red right there. But just like literally like a, a blazing emerald would look. 
There's also sapphires, the blue-headed sapphire found in the Western Andes here, and the golden-tailed sapphire in the Eastern Andes into the Amazon foothills. The family of wood nymphs, um, geographically, the emerald-bellied wood nymph with the emerald belly here, and you can see how the, the changes are in the forehead and the belly and the breast is much the same. The crowned wood nymph here in Northern Colombia up into the Caribbean basin and then the Amazon Eastern Andes, um, the fork tail wood nymph. And the coronets, um, again, in the Western Andes, the purple velvet coronet, from a photographer's perspective, this has to be one of the hardest birds to photograph because you got everything from white to black in one subject and glittering purple. And to try to get the dynamic range on most cameras in a dark setting um, without a flash is, is really difficult. The chestnut breasted coronet is displaying one of the other things that typically happens with coronets. The instant they land for a split second, they will raise their feather. And if you time it just right, you can get this photograph with their wings wide open as they're landing. The star frontlets that are found in the Eastern Andes, usually just north of, northeast of Bogota. Um, dazzling birds, the blue-throated star frontlet here, the golden-bellied star frontlet shown on the right. And as you go higher up are the puff legs with their little uh, boots. The emerald belly puff leg with the emerald belly here in the Eastern Andes and the glowing puff leg shown here. Perhaps most remarkable actually are the rainbow star front and the rainbow bearded thornbill. And going back to understanding the physiology of what's, or what's happening here, the physics, each one of these feathers has a slightly different composition that allows each of these uh, feathers to have a different um, refracted light, which when you think of the evolution, why a bird would go to that much trouble to have these different feathers here is, um, I guess quite remarkable. What's interesting, when we were there, when Bob and I saw this bird, we didn't have the opportunity. I, and I look back over my photos to compare the difference between one bird um, to another one. But if you go through the web and look at the pictures, you'll see that for the most part, the pattern stays the same. They usually, for the same subspecies, it's purple back there, sort of orange here and a yellow green here. And most of the thornbills will have the same sort of pattern that's here. Um, just again about iridescence and um, sexual characteristics. They can be identical as shown here with the coronets. There can be um, sexual dimorphism. The male often will have a slight gorget, which the female won't have here in the fawn breasted billion. They can be totally different. This is a male white vented plummeteer and this is the female here. And then they can also be uh, dimorphic by appearance, the blue racket tail, the male here. And this is the female, totally, totally different body structure here. And if you look at sexual mating, again, it becomes interesting. I, I could have had some videos of um, hermits really lacking iridescence and how they made it lex, but I think the one that's more interesting um, is some of the displays they do. And the one, if this works, this is the marvelous spatula tail. And you'll sort of see this is in a thick, literally bush thicket like this, probably about 20 yards away, this little bird was sitting. I was waiting for a female to come by. And then when it does, this is what the little guy would do. He just spins them around, spins them around, and then he goes off and uh, chases her here in a second. And what's also incredible is how with those spatulas, he can just sort of fly through the uh, bushes and forest like that. Yeah, I think there's been some interesting studies that show the courgette and how it's uh, related to foraging and aggressive behavior. And um, an ornithologist Blyweiss did a study of terminally sun angels where he showed this is the male here. It obviously has a, a, um, a brilliant courgette. But in the females, if you go north to south, there's a difference in the birds. And the females that seem to have a bit of a courgette here, more than north, were much more aggressive, both in display and also de defending feeding territories 
than in the south where they didn't have it. And similarly, you can see that same sort of characteristics in the amethyst go to the sun angels north to south, the difference shown here. And if you look at the evolution, some of the physiologic adaptations of hummingbirds, I think most people know a lot of these uh, about its met metabolic rate, the uh, heart taking up most or like 2.5% of the body weight, the uh, heart rate going 120 beats per minute, uh, the wing speed 50 to 70. And they have the largest hippocampal area in the brain, which really allows them, a hummingbird when it flies, it literally knows almost where every flower is on the path it's taking. And that's why if you ever change the position of a feeder in your backyard, you notice that the hummingbird goes to where the feeder was uh, and then looks around to see where you might have moved it. And that's because of their spatial learning and memory. And most of them have altitudinal migration ranges uh, where they'll go up and down perhaps 500 to 1,000 meters in the area they're located. If you look a little bit about the vegetation in the Andes, um, low down you have your subtropical rainforest, then you come into your cloud forest, and then you come into the Paramo. And I think uh, what Bob, where Bob and I have always enjoyed traveling the most is actually in the Paramo. And if I focus a little bit on that, um, the Paramo basically is a super Paramo where you're up above the transition zone to the snow line above 14 and a half thousand feet, the grassy Paramo here, uh, and the sub Paramo where there's just some shrubs, small thickets and grasses. And there's about 69 species of birds that are total users um, of the Paramo. And the hummingbirds that are there that are hill stars, metal tails, puff legs, helmet crests. I'm gonna talk a little bit about these now. The Paramo, all those pictures look nice. Most of the time you're there, it looks like this. It's foggy, it's misty, there's a cold wind, there can be wet snow. It's a really harsh environment. And you're almost asking yourself, why would any hummingbird wanna come up here? And to survive here, what they've had to do is they often have drab colors, uh, less iridescent feathers, a small colorful gorget, a shorter bill. They'll live in caves and burrows at night for warmth because the temperatures can drop to sub-freezing. They'll build thick walled nests and tunnels of rock crevices and line them with wool from alpaca or sheep. They'll cling to flowers rather than hover to conserve energy. Uh, often they'll forage on the ground for insects and less so on flower nectar. Larger species will have slower wing speed, but most, and perhaps really these last two, torpor, it's a state of induced hypothermia at night. They drop their body temperature by 30 degrees. Their heart rate drops from 1200 to 60. Their eyes are closed. You can't see any visible chest or lung movement. If you touch the bird, it won't respond. And then somehow magically an hour or two before sunrise over 20, 30 minutes, it'll awaken again. The other question is how they can function in such a low oxygen environment. And there was another uh, researcher, Chris Witt, who went up to the Andes. He had this special tent constructed where he could change the oxygen pressure within the tent. He misnetted some hummingbirds and then observed whether some how they responded in the tent to varying oxygen tensions, and then he released them at the end of the day. And basically at sea level, it's almost 21% oxygen concentration. By the time you get up to 15,000 feet, it's about 11.8, and then it keeps dropping. And he was able to show that the sparkling violet ear, one of the ones I showed earlier, was still able to fly in six to 7% oxygen. And how do they do it? They actually did a bit more research. I think most of us know hemoglobin, it's the basic protein in our body that transports oxygen. There's two alpha and beta chains. Um, but what they found was in the species at higher altitudes, there was a substitution of an amino acid, serine for glycine on the beta chain at two positions, B13 and B80, B beta 83 here. And that allowed uh, for much higher oxygen binding affinities so that the hemoglobin could carry more oxygen. But more incredible was that this evolution uh, didn't just happen in one family, but it happened by parallel evolution. Shown here are this for these various species, uh, which had the 13 mutation and which had the 83. And you can see that it happened in several um, genetic lines here rather than just one family. Some of the hummingbirds that you see in the Paramo, uh, some of the families, the metal tails. What's remarkable about these, if you look at some of them, like for instance, the violet-throated metal tail here, it's really on one volcano uh, that you find it here in uh, Western Ecuador. Similarly, the copper metal tail is just a small section of the Eastern Andes in Northern Peru. So some of these birds have very small defined ranges. 
The thorn bills have small bills, uh, the rainbow bearded shown here and the bronze tailed th thorn bills shown here from Northeast Colombia. The sunbeam is interesting in that rather than having the iridescence on the front, the bird has its iridescence on the back and there's various subspecies you should go through the Andes so have slight different color schemes across here. The white tufted sunbeam uh, that you find in uh, Northern Peru. But I think one of my personal favorites has always been the helmet crest. Uh, when you see these birds, they, they definitely need a haircut, but they're quite striking. Uh, this is the buffy helmet crest that's found in the central Andes um, around Daniel's hometown. This is a photo from the Cornell lab that hopefully I should have acknowledged at the beginning. I apologize. I did use a couple of their slides in return for all the, all the ones they have of mine. This is the uh, helmet crest that's found in the extension of the Andes into uh, Northwest Venezuela. Uh, haven't had the chance to go there or Daniel's offered. It's still not safe to go there. And the one that's probably the most striking uh, in the Eastern Andes, um, just east of Bogota, the green bearded helmet crest shown here. But the birds that go the highest are the black breast, sorry, the hill stars. This is the black breasted hill star from Northern Peru. And this is the Ecuadorian hill star. This is the photo Bob took on one of our trips. And they'll go up to 16, 17,000 feet. A little bit about the future of the hummingbirds. Unfortunately, due to habitat destruction, um, primarily in cloud forests because of logging and mining and in the promo farming and ranching, a lot of the habitat that's specific to these various species is being destroyed. And there's a lot, a lot of species that are in danger of extinction. The IUCN found in 1965 has seven categories for assessing the extinction risk of hummingbirds. And there's critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. And um, of the 21 species that are most endangered, either critically or, in, or danger or endangered, 12 of them are hummingbirds. And over half of the hummingbirds that are on these lists are high altitude species near the tree line of the Paramo, shown here, sadly. This is the habitat last, sorry, habitat, habitat loss in the Paramo. Uh, this is near Mount Los Nevados, again, where Daniel lives in uh, central Colombia. And you can just see swaths and swaths of what was once Paramo just uh, now grazing for cattle to just walk through these areas. In the cloud forest, you'll just be driving magnificent cloud forest, and suddenly there's these just tracks of open space again for farming. Um, it has to do with the poor tight leg registration system they have. There's often squatting along new roads. In other words, if you, there's a new road, you're the first one to cut this patch, it's yours. Uh, there's corruption, lack of transparency. There's a lot of issues with land ownership that are responsible for the destruction of the habitat through these areas. But there are a couple success stories. Um, the first one, Huembo and the spatula tail. The, the, the chap shown here in the middle was Santos Montenegro. He was a local potato farmer. In 2000, he met three photographers who had spent about five days looking for the spatula tail unsuccessfully. Uh, Santos took them to his farm and showed them several birds. They paid him $70. They were so grateful. In 2003, Roger Allman came from Calibri Expeditions to the Lex, saw it. He set up a spatula tail reserve. And then in 2005, um, they set up a protectorate with the American Bird Conservancy. In 2008, BBC, uh, Lord Attenberg came and filmed the now famous um, video on the spatula tail there. Ironically, he only paid them $300 and didn't offer to do anything to help the preservation effort. But I think that Santos. Uh, emphasize to his community the importance of the bird. Previously, it had been sort of hunted for aphrodisiac. There was far, far fewer males uh, because of that. And he convinces the, the community that uh, they needed to preserve the environment. They planted over 40,000 trees and they've now done demonstrations for um, coffee and sustainable farming and been working with Ecoan. And the last time we were there, it was a much better situation where they've turned it around for the bird and for the community. Another story in Northern Peru, Arena Blanca, uh, Norbo Vercera was an illegal, he grew up as a legal logger in the Amazon. And in his youth, he visited Huembo, uh, where we saw the spatula tail and what was happening. 
and he decided to make a difference. So he came back um, near Aguas Verde and uh, had 12 acres there and he built his own preserve. And it's actually quite incredible when you walk there, every one of these steps he hand cut, like he was a logger. He built this observation tower there. Ironically, obviously Amazon doesn't ship to the Amazon and you have to come up with a way to get hummingbird feeders. So what they do is they get Coke bottles and you convert a Coke bottle to a hummingbird feeder. Um, and he also built this incredible uh, blind where I um, didn't put a picture in, but if you can imagine a wooden log coming down, you're behind a blind and you can just open it and the corn falls out. And that's where tenemus and various wood quails will come out and can be easily seen. And then now there's a fair number of less common hummingbirds also coming, the pink throat or brilliant, the lance bill shown here, uh, and the various coquettes. So any charges are two, three dollars US for you to come and see the site. I promised to talk a little bit about photographing hummingbirds. Um, this is myself and a guide out of Bogota trying to photograph a uh, bronze-tailed hornbill in the Paramo. If you look at the ways you can photograph hummingbirds, uh, the way I look at it, there's really four sort of setting, four formats or styles. One is just natural setting. The other involves perches. You can do flight shots and natural sunlight, and then there's multi-flash setups. Natural settings, um, talking in general with birding, seems to be more popular in Europe. Uh, it's personal taste. I've never been wild on it. I sometimes prefer the cleaner backgrounds, but sometimes when you're on a trail, you have no choice. Often you're faced with difficult lighting, dark settings, and the, the um, busy backgrounds can be less pleasing. There's also depth of field issues with tele telephoto lenses. If you look at perch, subjects it's a lot easier you can set up your camera you're on a tripod you can control the uh, focusing a lot easier you can either do it on a feeder which again to me is the least desirable on a natural perch um, and if you watch the birds often they'll fly back and forth between a perch and a feeder so obviously photograph them on the perch or you can set up some perches above the feeder um, and the one question there is sometimes you wonder about the safety of feeders. When I was actually in California, I know Bob had an issue with his feeder and some pine siskins where they're all suddenly getting, uh, there was some dead birds and there's some disease going on about So I've never heard of something similar with hummingbirds, but you wonder when there's this many hummingbirds coming to one feeder. And this um, is a famous site west of Bogota where in a yard that's no more than 10 yards wide, there's over 40 humming feeders hanging and the birds are sort of flying around, flying around. So some people wonder whether the spread of disease with this crowding, they also wonder whether this many feeders can affect the natural selection that will be happening between hummingbirds. Um, and the other thing, obviously, I think most people know you don't use red dye because it causes serious fatal disease to the hummingbirds. A couple other tricks, learn from observation where the hummingbirds fly where they're perching. You can place branches or flowers near the feeders. The other thing is you can modify a feeder on your own with some alligator clips and this tubing that then allows you to put a more natural perch here. You can photograph and then with a bit of work in Photoshop, remove this and call it a photographic image. The other trick is you can use sugar water on flowers to try to attract the birds to a specific site where then you can take the photograph. Flight shots and sunlight, uh, they're fun. Uh, you can get dramatic photos with no special equipment. You basically set the f-stop to control the depth of field and the highest ISO you can get to get the high, fastest shutter speed. You want to get up as close as you can to 1 over 2,000. You need bright sunlight on the bird, preferably a dark background in the shade or something. And sometimes you have to position yourself in such a way to accomplish that. You can put tape over the feeders or use feeders that don't have perches. But the problem with this though, is that you can see in these photographs here, there's usually some part that's dark. Like here, the back is dark, there that's dark, and here the front of the bird is dark because of the, the angle of sunlight, the way it's coming in on the bird. Multi-flash setups, um, I guess to some people, this can become controversial. 
I'll talk a bit about it. Uh, it takes a lot of equipment and Bob will vouch for this one. When we used to, truthfully, I've done less and less of this the last few years, but when we were doing more of it about four or five years ago, there'll be a suitcase full of 30, 40 pounds of equipment. There'd be four or five, six flashes, backup flashes, 50 batteries, uh, chargers, light stands, triggers, pre-printed screens, uh, all this equipment. And when you set it up, it basically looks like these setups here where there's the camera, this is the target zone where the bird want to come to a feeder. You have two, three flashes in front of the bird, uh, one behind to correct for the backlighting that you had the problem with the natural lighting. And then there's a one flash here on the printed background screen. Yeah, you don't need a tripod. The tripod is really more just to let you rest the big heavy, heavy telephoto, as you can see here, as well as doing it, just holding it uh, a 7D with the 100 to 400. Uh, lens without anything. And this is what it looks like if you set it up out in the uh, real jungle. Um, there's the background print, the hanger, sort of the feeder, and here's the flashes around it. Basically, a couple of things about it. It, re it requires darker ambient lighting conditions. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. What that means is that wherever the target zone is, it has to be darker than the overall ambient lighting. And uh, either by having an overhang or just a cloudy, cloudy, shady tree. The camera you, you put into manual mode uh, so you can control the settings. The shutter speed is one or two or 50, which is really linked more to the fastest sync that you can do with your flashes rather than that that's going to freeze the action. The white balance can either be auto or set to flash. The ISO is usually somewhere about 200 to 400. The f-stop, you're going to run 16 to 22, and that's usually so to give you expanded depth of field. And the autofocus, you can either set a manual that you're focused manually on this point or some type of uh, servo zone focus. It's the flash that does all the magic. You set it up in manual mode at 1 over 32, and the higher this number goes, the shorter the pulse of light that comes out of the flash. And at 1 over 32, the flash of light is about 1, 20,000th of a second, that that's what's freezing the action of the wings of the hummingbird. The zoom that you put on the flash, it depends what the flash is doing. For the background flash, you want to have it a little wider so you don't really get any highlighting effect. But depending where you position the flash in relation to the bird, if you want to get more light there, then you can tell the photo in a bit um, the zoom. You typically, with the flashes that we would use, they would be set at set distance 18 to 24 inches from the target. And again, it's the flash that freezes the action. So a couple of things about when you get these photographs, the wing position here is total luck. Um, in one twenty thousandth of a second, this wing can be anywhere and you're gonna have to take a lot of photos to get the ones that really look good like these here. This shows what happens. It's not a photograph taken at night. It's just the flash on the background print did not fire. And that's why there's no light there, it's black. Um, the autofocus, on the newer cameras is good, but when we were first doing this a decade ago, they weren't fast enough often to capture the bird moving in and out. You'd have to rely more on presetting your focus point. The hummingbirds, it takes them a while if you're going into a new area to adapt to the flashes and the setup. And there's some specific issues I'm gonna talk about in a minute, ghosting, hazing, and shadows. Um, and a couple other things, uh, does the flash cause any harm? And most people will quote this article uh, by these two fellas here who were, if I get this correct, uh, ophthalmologist technologists, but also bird photographers, who tried to suggest that the ratio of rods, which is night vision and cones, um, is what counts, and birds have higher ratio of cones. The inverse square of light falling off the distance it goes, therefore, it really doesn't do anything to the birds. But in the medical literature, there have been case reports well documented of temporary night blindness. One was a photographer who walked accidentally in front of a powerful Nikon flash that triggered and the runway model, with too many flashes going off over a long photo shoot where they were uh, temporarily night blind for up to several months, but it did eventually revert. So it's open for debate as to um, the effect on the birds. Having done it, it doesn't seem to bother them. And, um, but I think having said that, it's easy to abuse multi-flash setups. Like you can just stand there and just fire, 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 14 frames a second with powerful units. 
uh, hoping to get a picture. And that's really not the way to do it. The better way is you have to watch the bird. You have to learn when it's going to fly in, when it's going to fly out, and judiciously fire the, 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 the setup when it's most appropriate, rather than just randomly try to fire 15 times to get one shot. The other question that's interesting, does the flash alter the iridescence of the bird? Shown here, I think this was actually a photo Bob took of a cook who's hermit in a multi-flash setup. And you can see there's sort of this greenish golden coloration here that often one would associate, oh, the flash has put too much light on the bird. But this is the same bird photographed in natural sunlight, a photo I took a couple years later. And you can see that same effect coming across here just from the sunlight. And for the most part, the coloration of the bird looks identical in both photos, except for white balancing. Here's two shots of a, a white whiskered hermit. This one with multi flash, and this one in sunlight or natural light. And again, the birds look the same. The problems I referred to earlier ghosting is when you get blurring of the wings. And what this means is there's excessive ambient light. The, the flash froze the image, but then there was enough ambient to light in that one 250 the second for while the wings were moving, they created the blur. <clears throat> so basically the solution to here is you have to get to a darker setting. The more puzzling one that only happened once in Tobago was where you got this central bright haziness and I double checked the setup and I swore being was correct and still could not get rid of it. And eventually figured out when the clouds moved over to what it was, was there was sunlight coming back through the back of the camera through the viewfinder it was somehow getting through and causing the central haziness. The other thing, if you're going to do manual focusing, is there's a very fine target zone. Like here you can see this bird is in sharp focus, but this hermit, the tip of the bill is sharply focused, but because it's behind your target zone, this area here really is not sharp focus anymore. Um, and again, even if you use the newer autofocus, again, what, depending what you're going to focus on, the bird will determine how sharp the image will be. The um, shadowing effects, just these two photos of the, <clears throat> the small hermit here at the same plant can show the difference where even if the bird is just a little bit back from your target zone and rolled over how much darker the image is compared to where it is if you want it. And the flash placement will determine whether you get the shadowing here on the back versus that or not. The background prints, um, they, uh, earliest ones we use were monochromatic. Uh, most people that do this often will just print them themselves. You go and take some photographs. And really the challenge is that it's the depth of field perspective. And it happens in two ways. You have to blur the photo you take, and then you have to try to imagine how that photo is going to be positioned relative to the depth of field of your setup with the target zone and where your camera is. And the other thing is that when you have the print, most people use a blurry one like this, it's actually only a small portion of it that ends up being in the final image. The flowers, um, again, the issues that come up there, if they're very waxy, you'll get a lot of reflections. And in some ways it becomes a, a challenge. The creative part of doing this is here's an ericacia, the way it looks in this natural setting. Here's when we put it up in a, uh, multi setup, multi flash setup, and the same here where you're, you're trying to emulate what is the look you're going to go. You're going to try to get a look that looks more like this or something with a cleaner background. But in the end, it often boils down to uh, personal style and personal taste. Here's some examples of when it works. This is a, um, <clears throat> a star frontlet. If you're really lucky, you'll get two birds uh, for the price of one. And often you'll get incredible um, images showing the aerodynamic uh, mastery that the hummingbirds have going backwards, forwards, upside down, just hovering what they're doing, images like this. So if I've convinced you to consider perhaps trying this, how do you get there? Uh, this is Air Canada parked at Bogota Airport. And a few things about <clears throat> logistics. Travel, it's safe. Uh, expect the unexpected. There's going to be traffic delays due to trucks. Avoid driving at night. There's going to be landslides, mudslides. Uh, you may encounter strikes. One time Bob and I were there, the entire 
western part of Colombia was going to shut down for three days because the coffee workers were going to protest. You may come across army units doing um, militia training, and uh, you may have to go under <clears throat> great waterfalls where there's a huge 100-yard drop here down into a canyon. One day to the next, a tree may fall across. But the bottom line is, when it happens, you'll always find some other birding, some other way to fill your time and make use of it. And it is safe. And all the travel done over 15 years, touch wood, have never had an incident. Similarly, health, and this, I'm not going to touch COVID, but prior to COVID, um, especially Colombia, they have great reporting for their diseases. You can go to almost any area and week by week, they'll tell you the number of cases of infectious diseases. This is the mosquito, the Egyptes, that's for dengue fever and chikungunya um, uh, fever. This is the bot fly. This is the little beetle that does uh, Chagas disease, snakes, altitude sickness. But again, if you're sensible and watch what you do, uh, we've had no issues. The people, they're incredible. They're friendly, helpful. They're very proud of their heritage. They're colorful. You'll get some amazing photos and never miss an opportunity to visit a local market. The food, um, it's everything from a basic breakfast, plantains, rice, eggs, fresh fruit, and on down to some of the um, uh, sorts we're going to mention in a minute. You can get really well prepared pork, quinoa, various salads. Um, it, that was food that never been an issue to us either. The lodging, it's everything. This is the most basic lodging I think we had in all our trips, uh, was a lodging. Uh, the Anshakaya uh, Valley um, in, the, in the Choco Lowlands, just a basic bed, but a clean shower. A lot of times there's dormitory type uh, accommodations. You can get excellent B&Bs like this one shown here, or even uh, fancy uh, four-star resorts. If you had to ask me, um, here's a list. I can talk about this more if people wanted to put various favorite lodges, but if I country by country had to pick out one, um, I think in Colombia, my favorite has been Finca Mucharejo, our observatory at Calibri. It's owned by Victoria Lizaralda. She's been there over a decade. She started planting flowers and got interested in hummingbirds and now has about 14 species that come there. Uh, it's very well set up. It's a small B&B, a stay in these sort of a couple of cottages. She has great food. Uh, and there's some amazing birds that photograph. Uh, the blue-throated star frontlet, the glowing puff leg, amethyst-throated sun angel. Under these sort of awnings, you can set up multi-flash like we have there. I did a workshop there a couple of times uh, a few years back. And it's very close to Shigaza um, Reserve where you get the helmet crest, the thornbills, and some other birds. In Ecuador, if I had to send someone, I'd probably go to Mindaloma Reserve. Um, it's again, family run by the Herreras. They have much more extensive trails where you can also see other birds, but they have this area shown in the back here on the second floor that was built I, initially for an American photographer, shown here, where you can do setups uh, for multi-flash, for hummingbirds. There's feeders around here and all there's fruit feeders for various tanners you can stand there whether it's reading or not. And again, they have some really colorful species, the velvet purple coronet, the empress brilliant, the sylph, the brown inca, and some others. And if I had to pick one in Peru, and this was hard, probably Kenti Tambo. Um, it's a small sort of B&B &B that's really off the beaten track, an hour's flight from Lima and seven hours from Terracotto. The Adrian van Hagen, who uh, developed it, was really built as, as an offshoot to the cultural museum that she runs there. And <clears throat> again, there's some amazing food shown here, uh, really great lodging, very, very friendly people. And again, some amazing birds there, the star, rainbow star frontlet, little wood star, purple sun angel. So I think with that, that's it.